Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. As always, it's great to be in God's house with you again today. Today we are continuing our sermon series, Pure Gospel, which is based on the book of Romans. This book of the Bible, perhaps more than any other, expresses the gospel message of Jesus as our Savior from sin in its, well, purest form, probably because this is the one congregation which Paul had never visited. And so, as he wrote to them, he wanted to make sure that they were all on the same page before he did end up visiting them. Today in Romans, we will hear the strange-sounding encouragement that you can see on the screen as our focus today, our theme, Be a Sacrifice. We'll talk about what that means in our sermon and throughout our service as we focus on the biblical concept of sacrifices and the even greater sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, the payment for all our sins. Again, it's great to be in God's house with you today. May God bless us once more as we gather together in his name. And let us begin our worship. Please stand. We begin worship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, about whom the scriptures proclaim. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. But though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. As we think about the weight of the many sins which Jesus bore, we also confess our sins before God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart, nor have I loved my brothers and sisters as myself. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. This I deserve your punishment now and in eternity. O Lord, I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. Cleanse me and release me from my guilt. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus who suffered and died for us. Grant us your Holy Spirit to amend our sinful lives. Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his son to offer himself as the atoning sacrifice for all sin. For Jesus' sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness into his wonderful light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is indeed our sacrificial lamb. This work of the Lord is great and glorious. Let us praise his name.
We continue by joining our hearts in prayer. We pray. O merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In today's first reading, taken from select portions of Leviticus 1 and 6, we hear about the burnt offering that most directly serves as the basis for the sacrifice we will talk about in our sermon text. So we read these words, notice how whole and lasting God intended this sacrifice to be, this burnt offering, which indicates how whole and lasting he intends our sacrifices to be before him. We listen as God speaks to us here. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. And the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he is to take off, his, off these clothes and put on others and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonial clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning and must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Word of the Lord. We continue now with our psalm. And as we think about what we just heard in Leviticus, you may already be realizing that our sacrifices before God, whatever they may be, they are not perfect. They are not as whole and lasting as what we just heard described. However, today's psalm, Psalm 121, tells us that God's faithful love towards us is perfect. It is whole and lasting in every way, even more so than these sacrifices. Let's read this word of the Lord together. Keep me, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me, hide me in the shadow of your wings. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. Today's second reading now from Matthew chapter 18, Jesus reminds his disciples and us also that our standing in heaven is not about us 
or how great we are. It's about Jesus and a humility that we rely on him. Indeed, a humility that means becoming like little children. And that's hard. It involves sacrifices for us to be humble in this way. But it leaves us much better off in the end, as we'll hear in these words and more in our sermon. We listen once more as God speaks to us in this world. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is God's word. We'll continue now with our hymn of the day. Take my life and let it be. It's in 469. If you are following along with the sheet music printed in your bulletin, we'll sing verses 1 and 2 and then 5 and 6. sermon series, Hear Gospel. As a reminder, we're in the second half of the book of Romans, where the rubber of the gospel meets the road of our lives. And today, as God tells us to be sacrifices, we're going to see that he doesn't quite mean something as appalling as that verse sounds, but with this type of language, he is trying to say something that is very striking, something that he very much wants you and I to take to heart this morning. 
Well, let's listen as God carefully explains that to us through the Apostle Paul. As we continue in Romans, they were in Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Here Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's so much to talk about there. It's so dense that we're going to stop and focus on this. We'll get to the rest of our sermon text later. So right away in verse 1, we build upon the gospel message that has been at the forefront of this book. It is in view of God's mercy that Paul then encourages his listeners to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice. And there it is. There's our focus. Uh, probably the closest parallel to the sacrifice would be what we heard in our first reading, that burnt or whole offering, where the entire animal was sacrificed up on the altar in the flames, and it symbolized the whole or complete dedication of the one offering the sacrifice to the Lord. But now, what does it mean that Paul tells his listeners, and that ultimately includes us, that we are to be this kind of sacrifice, this burnt offering, this whole sacrifice. Well, it may involve some pain or difficulty. After all, it is a sacrifice that we're talking about, and that implies suffering, that implies giving up something. But as living sacrifices, we realize Okay, God's not asking us to do anything crazy, like literally killing ourselves or something like that. No, instead, as we live, we are to be these sacrifices. The sacrifices that are, as Paul tells us, continuing, holy and pleasing to God. Holy, which simply means to be set apart for a special purpose. So putting this all together, then, and similar to what we heard about that Old Testament sacrifice, what God desires is that we would be wholly dedicated to him, to what he wants, and that in this way we would live differently. All of which makes this a sacrifice that it's not just a superficial thing, right? It happens on the outside and it happens on the inside. As Paul continues in verse 2, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You think about this world's pattern that Paul mentions here. It is the opposite of everything we're talking about, really. I mean, our world lives to avoid pain. Our world lives to pursue my path and what I want instead of God's path and what he wants. But as we heard, what God wants is for us to be transformed. Not just conformed on the outside, but Transform where everything has changed for us inside and out. And then finally, when we do this, notice what Paul says happens. Then he says, You will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Now, what does that mean? How can we test and approve God's will? Well, perhaps it makes more sense when you realize that Paul also tells us what this testing and approving will discover. Right after that, in verse 2. He says, we will find that God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. It's Paul's way of saying, by fully dedicating yourself to the Lord, by being this kind of sacrifice, it will only lead you to realize that God's ways really are best. He knows what he's doing. What he asks you to do is for a reason, and it is for a good reason. Ultimately, this is Paul's way of saying that whatever comes from God, whether it's on earth or in heaven, it truly is good and pleasing and perfect. That's what you'll find as you put it to the test. It's kind of like how you might test 24 karat gold. By testing it, it doesn't make it any less. Rather, it reveals that that really is what you think it is. It really is as good as it appears to be if it passes that test. 
So again, back to our theme today. God tells us to be a sacrifice, to be living sacrifices. And if you think about what we talked about, do you understand why he says that? He says that because quite simply, I am not often this kind of sacrifice. Instead of wholly dedicating myself to the Lord, I often instead obsess over what I want, what I would prefer to do. I do conform to the pattern of this world. I don't want to do what's difficult, but good. Rather, I want to do what's easy. And you can see that in many different ways in our lives. I mean, for starters, you can just see it in superficial ways. There's a reason why good things like eating well, eating healthy, uh, exercise, waking up early, taking responsibility and more responsibility, there's a reason why those things are difficult for us to do. So why as kids, our parents had to teach us to eat our vegetables and not watch TV all day and wake up and go to school and be responsible and have chores. It's because these things, simply put, they are not natural for us. We don't naturally gravitate towards doing them. That's why we have to work hard at the same time. And as you think about that, in those examples, you realize that we can see this in far more serious ways also. For example, how about what God says in this holy law? There's a reason why people in this world who are born without a Christian foundation, and indeed, many who are born with a Christian foundation, why they will just sleep around when they are given the opportunity, or they might steal if there are no consequences for that action, or they will put other people down if it makes them look better in some way. Indeed, there's a reason why you and I are tempted by, and indeed fall into some of these things. Or how about doing good for other people, but doing good in a way that it involves us sacrificing something? There's a reason why I don't quickly, I don't easily sacrifice my time or my money or my abilities to help other people. Because again, same thing we've seen since we were children. This is not natural for us. We have to work hard at doing these things, therefore, because of it. To put it in another way, what we are talking about today is that our default setting is not to be transformed, as our sermon text talked about. It's to be conformed, where, okay, we may look good on the outside, and yet there's no real change of heart. But then what do we really earn from that? I mean, if we are conformed to the ways of this world, for example, as our sermon text talked about then, Paul also told us we are missing out on what God says is good and pleasing and perfect. And that implies that what we've instead found by being conformed to the world is something that is bad and unpleasing and imperfect. And that all explains, when you think about it, why God needs to tell us to be a sacrifice. Because if he doesn't, then our, our, our nature is simply to gravitate to what is easy, what we want to do, but not necessarily what's right. We gravitate what is easy, but what may ultimately be wrong in the end and be harmful. To put it bluntly, another way of talking about what we're talking about today is that our default setting is to sin. It's to serve ourselves rather than God and others. Because, well, we talk about what we are naturally inclined to do. We are naturally born with a sinful nature that stands opposed to God, rebels against Him, and doesn't want to do the things that He says are good, that come from Him. And no matter how you spin it, if you just think about it, that's never going to end well when we are opposed to God, when we are living in sin. In fact, not only will that not end well, that will end in hell. The Bible is very plain about that. So, no, we don't want to be conformed to a broken, dying world. That would mean us nothing. We want to be transformed to a new and living hope. Thankfully, that is exactly what God does. He transforms us. Picture for a moment a beautiful new butterfly that comes from an old, ugly caterpillar, something that is very different. That's really what God does for us in, in a manner of speaking. He transforms us to something that is different, something that is better, 
something that is new. And specifically, what we're talking about today is the transformation of how God looks at us. Because the thing is, you and I may still look in the mirror and we may still see sin, right? We may still see that ugly caterpillar. We may still see ourselves as we are and not be happy with it. But the thing is, that doesn't change the fact that when God looks at you and when he looks at me, he sees a beautiful new butterfly. And interestingly, that's why God first wants us to see his law, why he first wants us to see our sin, to start with what you would otherwise see, why he first wants us to humble ourselves, as we talked about in our gospel reading. Because if we don't do these things, if we just look into the mirror and we see it, not as it really is, but just think everything's okay, then we won't be conformed to the way of the world because we'll think, you know what, I've got this handled all on my own. I don't need God's intervention. I'm set. But on the other hand, if we do look into the mirror, if we see the reality of the problem, we see our sin, we will be transformed by God because that's when we realize, okay, he actually offers me an answer to this problem. The only answer there is the precious blood of Jesus who died on the cross to take away my sin. And finally, that's just it. His sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, is the ultimate sacrifice. What we can never hope to present before the Lord as a sacrifice Jesus was wholly dedicated to his heavenly Father. In fact, Jesus' sacrifice was so good, it was so complete on our behalf, that now, the Bible says in many places, when God looks at you and me, he doesn't really see us anymore. What he sees is his son, Jesus. In other words, when you sin, when I am not the sacrifice God intends for me to be, God still looks at us and he sees us as sinless. He sees us as a perfect sacrifice. And it's all because he still sees his son Jesus, who was those things on our behalf as our substitute. That's that sacrifice. I mean, if you think about that, you take that to its logical conclusion. That means when you and I sin, and when we do some terrible things, when we are lazy, when we are selfish, when we are gluttonous, when we are drunk, when we are sexually immoral, when we are selfish, when we are self-righteous and self-serving. Yet, God looks at us and he sees people who are pure, righteous, holy, godly, beautiful in every way. Because when God looks at us, he sees his son Jesus covering that sin. Jesus who was none of those other things. I mean, what other word can you use to describe that other than mercy, grace? The very thing Paul started this reading with again. We, we don't deserve it in any way, and yet God, in love for us, he has transformed us. He has transformed the way that he looks at us in spite of our, our sins that we commit. He has sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts through water and the word, who has planted faith in our hearts, faith that clings to Christ and what he's done for us that changed the way God looks at us. It is, quite simply, the pure gospel that we've heard since the beginning of this series. It all goes back to that. And so, with that in mind, or if you want to use the language that Paul used at the beginning of our sermon text, in view of God's mercy, seeing how he has transformed us, now go back to our theme. Be a sacrifice. In other words, be wholly dedicated to the Lord in everything that your beliefs in what you do. In view of God's mercy, what does that now mean to be a sacrifice? Well, listen as Paul explains that to us, wrapping up our sermon text, beginning with verse 3. He says, For by the grace given me, there's that grace again, Paul was the foundation, I say to each and every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. And honestly, how can you do adopt the mindset from the first couple of verses? Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. See, we, that means we focus not on ourselves and on what we want and on what we can get out of things, but we focus on Christ, who is the, the object of our faith. We focus on what he has done, on what he wants. It's all about that faith. And now a specific example, verse 4. 
just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Again, there's the grace, there's the foundation. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encourage. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so at the end of our sermon text here, this living sacrifice, or to put it in another way, this spiritual act of worship, which Paul also called it earlier in our sermon text, it starts, perhaps predictably, in the context of the church. And it's a needed starting point, isn't it? I mean, don't we often envision these matters of sacrifice, of worship, in terms of the church? Perhaps, especially, we start with something like attendance, being in church. Now, granted, as we think about the importance of receiving the pure gospel message, and we think about the treasure that it is to us, of course we need to be here in church gathered around the world. I mean, if we can't even do that for starters, we've got a bigger problem that needs to be dealt with. But now, since we all are gathered together in church today, and I'm so glad you're all here, take it to the next step, the next level that Paul does. He says that there are many parts that form the whole, the body. And you think about that in the context of church. What that means is it's not just about me as a pastor. It's not just about what I say. It's about each and every one of you. The body needs each and every one of you. That's what Paul says. We need each and every one of you to be involved. And indeed, I know that many of you are. Whether it's that you play music in church, or you teach Sunday school, or you're active in our Bible studies, and you encourage one another, or you're involved in our various outreach opportunities, you write new mover postcards, or you invite friends to church, or you do some of the other things that need to be done around church to keep things going, uh, leadership, uh, maintenance, uh, keeping the books. So many of you are, are involved in so many ways. That's great. But with that being said, if you aren't involved in any of these ways, or if you could use being involved more, please talk to me. I, I can get you more involved. I, I guess that's kind of my role as a pastor in some ways. And I would love to do that. I mean that in only a positive way. Because here's the thing, I understand. That's going to be hard to do, right? We're Americans. Our lives are busy. We never have enough time. And I know each and every one of you has important things to do in your life that God has given to you to take care of. And you need to take care of them. But at the same time, as we take a, a moment to step back from all that and worship this morning and just look at things objectively through the lens of God's Word, well, we are talking about dedication today. We are talking about sacrifice, are we not? And sacrifice involves... Well, sacrifice, it involves some pain. And finally, what could be more important than making a sacrifice to dedicate yourself to, for starters, making sure you're hearing the gospel regularly. After all, that is the message that saves. That is the only thing that lands us in heaven. And, and then also, being dedicated to our work as a congregation, whatever way it may be, so that we can bring that gospel message to other people. So again, talk to me if, if you're not involved or if you could be involved more. I'll help you get involved. That's a part of my role as a pastor. I'd love to do that. That's what God wants to. And yeah, with that being said, what we are talking about today may start with the church in our text, but it's not an exclusive tool. If it were, then it would just be an outward or partial sacrifice or form of worship, a, a confirmation if you uh, conformity, if you will, and not a transformation that affects our very natures and, and therefore affects everything in our lives. So, so no, if, if we are living sacrifices, if we are wholly dedicated to the Lord, that means our entire lives are an act of worship. That means everything we do, whether in church or elsewhere, we do it to the glory of God. So take all those things we just talked about in the context of the church, doing what God wants, living according to what he says, making those kinds of sacrifices, 
and make sure you're applying them elsewhere in your life. Do good for other people. Do what's right. Do what God wants, even when it's hard. Make sure you're doing that in the sphere of your, your job, your place of employment, and in terms of other responsibilities and callings God has given you. Do what's right. Uh, do so among your, your friends and your family. And in the end, realize one more time why we do this, going back to the foundation of things. It, it, it's not because we have to. It's not because this earns us anything. No, we do these things because we want to. We do these things because it is the proper reaction. It, it's, it's the natural response to hearing the pure gospel message. Like we talked about a couple years, a couple weeks ago with, uh, with the fruit and the roots. This is just the byproduct of it. So, one more time today, think of your Savior. Think of his sacrifice for you, which we've been focusing on today. Think of what he suffered. Think of how much you are loved by your God. And then, only then, when you're thinking of those things, take our theme to heart. Be a sacrifice. It's going to be hard, sure, but it will be good. And it will help other people, of course. But as it comes from a heart that's been transformed by Christ, it will help us too. After all, as Paul said, the more wholly dedicated we are to the Lord, the more we will be able to test and approve the things that come from Him, whether things here on earth or the things in heaven. And we will see that, boy, what comes from God, it is good, it is pleasing, it is perfect. We will see all the more the great treasure we found as we put it to the test, this pure gospel message. So, dear fellow believers in Christ, take it to heart. Be a sacrifice. It is a good thing. Amen. Please stand. And now may this peace of God which passes all our human understanding. Start and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life which is everlasting. Amen. We will continue as we been doing throughout this series uh, with our confession of faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we will continue with our children's sermon. That's why I invite the kids to come up at this time.
today I'd like to talk to you about, you can look at either screen, that thing. Anybody know what that is? It kind of looks like a snake, but it's not a snake. Yeah, Isaiah's got it. That is a caterpillar. And sometimes they look a little bit different. Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're brown like that. Sometimes you can see their legs a little more, sometimes they're fuzzy. But still, tell me, do you think it's a pretty little insect, a little bug, or is it kind of an ugly little bug? It's kind of an ugly little bug, don't you think so? Do you think it's ugly right here? I think it's kind of ugly, right? Yeah, it looks kind of slimy. I don't know if I want that crawling around on me, right? But there's something really cool that happens to caterpillars, which I think some of you may know about. What what happens to a caterpillar, Isaiah? I don't know. Yeah, they eat lots of food. They store up lots of energy to help them grow, just like you guys have to eat all your food, right, to help you grow. And they, oops, I went too far. They go into that cocoon, that green thing, and inside that green thing, they grow into something. What do they grow into? Isaiah said it. Anybody else catch it? What do they grow into? A butterfly. A butterfly, right? Now let me ask you, that butterfly, is that butterfly better looking than the caterpillar? Yeah, butterflies are way prettier than the caterpillar. Like, if a butterfly lands on my hand, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty butterfly. If I got a slimy, ugly caterpillar on my hand, I don't like that. But it's, it's the same animal. It's just that it went through, we call it a transformation. It was one thing. It was that ugly caterpillar. But then it went into the cocoon, as Isaiah said very well. And then it turns into a butterfly. It's been transformed. The reason I want to show this to you today is not because you and I are caterpillars. But God says we can be transformed. So what does that mean? We're not going to turn into a butterfly, are we? Um, but we are transformed. And here's what God means by that. Even though you and I do some things that are sinful, that are wrong, God says he transforms us. So even though we do things that look ugly, kind of like that caterpillar, maybe we disobey our parents, we may hurt a friend or shove them to the ground. We do things that we know are bad. God doesn't like that. They're ugly. But God says when he looks at us, he sees a beautiful butterfly. How could that be? <coughs> he can see lots of things. That's right. But why is it that God sees us as so beautiful like that butterfly, even though we have ugly sins like that caterpillar? Can anybody tell me? Reagan, what makes the difference? Why does God see us as a beautiful butterfly? Yeah, did we hear that? Don't raise your hand next time, Elijah. But, right, Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins, so even though our sins make us ugly, because Jesus died for our sins, God sees us beautiful like a butterfly. We're transformed, and that's really cool. And God tells us because our sins are gone, because we've been transformed, he's going to take us to heaven. God tells us even when we continue to sin, as long as we have faith in Jesus, that's always how God sees us. Even when we see our ugly sins like that caterpillar, what God always sees is the butterfly. He sees us as beautiful and perfect as long as we have Jesus. Is it really important to have Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, that's why we talk about him all the time. So let's pray about that again. And we'll ask God to help us always to have Jesus. So we fold our hands, we bow our heads, and we pray, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit to teach us about Jesus. Thank you for giving us the Bible to learn about Jesus. Thank you for baptizing us through whom we receive, through which we receive Jesus in a special way. Always help us to have Jesus so that you can always see us as perfect and without sin. Beautiful, just like that butterfly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's say it together. Amen. Wow. All right, thank you guys so much for coming up. You have a good rest of your day. We'll see you later. We will continue at this time with the prayer of the church, which you can find in your bulletins and on the screens. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, your eyes are on the righteous and your ears are open to their prayers. And thank you for the assurance you give us through that promise. You know all too well the spiritual and physical struggles we have when we face extended periods of difficulty and distress. They hold to your word, but at the same time, 
voices rise within us, saying that you have forsaken and forgotten us. Strengthen our trust that you are in all things working for our good, so that we find our peace and joy in you. O Lord, hear our prayer. Savior of the world, you rule over all things for the good of your church. You establish governments, including those led by unbelievers, to carry out your will and to serve your people. Enable us to see our civic officials through your eyes so that we may give you glory through the honor we direct to them. Bless those who are our local, state, and national authorities that they may carry out their responsibilities wisely and well. O Lord, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, you empower us with your gifts that we might carry out the ministry to which you have called us. Give us a love for those whom you have loved, so that we call for repentance those who do not acknowledge their sin. Give us faithfulness and steadfastness to continue this work during those times when it seems to be making no difference. Give us humility to understand and acknowledge that we are who we are only because of your undeserved love. In these ways and more, cause us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. O Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we have had the privilege of being able to gather with others for worship this morning. Be with those who were unable to. If they are absent because of a weak faith, rekindle in them these zeal for you. If it is because of sickness or any other difficulty, heal and restore them. If it is because they are traveling, keep them safe on their journeys. If it is because they do not know you, bring them to a knowledge of their salvation. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Hear us, Lord, also as we bring you our private prayers. You have assured us, Heavenly Father, that the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. It is in that promise that we come before you and also pray, as your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear brothers and sisters in the faith, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord your God with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. And we will close with our final hymn, O God, Your Hand, the Heavens Made. We'll sing all the stanzas.
sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Such an interesting perspective. I don't know how often I wake up in the morning and think, okay, be a sacrifice today. But when you think about what we heard in our sermon and God's word to us, that's good advice. Um, so I know I'm, I'm trying to tell myself to do that this coming week. Every morning, wake up, be a sacrifice. Remember what that means. Uh, this is your true and proper act of worship. And, uh, uh, give that a try. Uh, see if you can remember that. Be a sacrifice throughout the week. Um, and, and as we do so, we will be blessed. We will be a blessing to others. And uh, we will be drawn even more closely to the, the love and mercy of our God. What a wonderful thing that is. Some announcements as we look ahead to before we look at those announcements. We have our Wells Connections. We get an update from our side. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. COVID-19 has had a major impact on our congregations and schools and how we all do our Savior's work together. That's true at Martin Luther College as well. But in many ways, the pandemic has further reinforced the need for preparing the next generation of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers. Before the pandemic, the graduates of Martin Luther College faced a challenge unique to our modern times. The people they were ministering to were busy. But the coronavirus cleared away many of those distractions, and that presents an opportunity. This is why we exist. Opportunities like this aren't our problem. They are our opportunity to reach a world that's suddenly asking questions of eternal importance and of life and death. Preparing the workers who can lead our churches forward in Jesus has always been the mission of Martin Luther College, and this new generation has a special desire to make a difference in the world. You can know my faith. What I'm doing matters for these people forever, whether it's the little ones in the classroom or the older ones in the congregation. We are helping a new generation grasp I can make a difference with my life for people forever. No one wants these students to be saddled with debt as they begin lives of ministry. And that's why the leadership at the college is focused on plans to increase student assistance. It is to the benefit of gospel ministry and our good and as those they serve that they are not burdened by the sense I have this huge financial debt. We are blessed the less they have to think about that, and the more they can think about the ministry that was called them to do. In addition to making college more affordable, the NLC 25th anniversary campaign, called Equipping Christian Witnesses, also has goals of increasing enrollment and funding needed updates of facilities to serve our students better. That it can be a campus that they are glad to be present on also because it's a beautiful place functional for their years of college education. We rejoice in the mission of NLC to train a core of Christian witnesses who are qualified to meet the ministry needs of Wells. Pastor Rich Durgel, whom you just met, began serving as the new president of Martin Luther College in July as MLC continues their long tradition of serving and equipping the next generation of call workers in Christ's kingdom. Just a reminder for those of you who don't know, uh, Martin Luther College is where all of our pastors and teachers go through. So uh, I'm a graduate of MLC. Heather was uh, training to be a teacher. Um, so it just it, it's a great thing for us to support. Um, if, 
ever you are looking for that extra opportunity, if the Lord has blessed you in a way where you can give kind of that extra offering and you're looking for something, they don't all have to be here at Grace. There are other great causes. Um, I would say MLC is always a good place to consider just as we continue our mission as a congregation and making sure that we have pastors and teachers who we know what we're talking about because we know what the Bible says. And that's what MLC's mission is, to train pastors and teachers to be faithful proclaimers of God's Word. So... Great update, great reminders there for us. Uh, some announcements as we look ahead at the coming week. Thursday night Bible study. We'll start Jonah, which is kind of a fun book to do as we continue to work our way through the Minor Prophets. As always, everyone's invited. We'd love to have more. Great time to jump in since we're starting a new book and a fun book at that. I mean, what, what's what's more fun than a guy getting eaten by a whale, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that and other things too. Saturday morning men's Bible study. Uh, we'll continue on in the book of Ruth. Again, love to have more people for that. And then next week, Sunday, we will begin a new Bible study before worship at 9 on the end times as we're getting into the end time season of the church year. Uh, technically, that season doesn't start until the following Sunday, so we'll start at a week early in Bible study. Uh, so looking forward to that again. Another great opportunity. If you haven't been in Bible study, get into it as we're starting something new. And then we'll wrap up our worship series on Romans before we get into that end time season of the church year. A couple of other announcements here. Uh, just a reminder, there is a leadership team meeting after church today. Uh, also, I believe this was announced last week. I can't remember if I got it in the newsletter this week or not. Uh, but there is uh, kind of a special Bible study coming up for the ladies in the congregation, a women's Bible study and brunch. Uh, that will be on October 31st, Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. And uh, since it's a brunch, everyone's invited to bring a dish to pass. And I think it'll be a little longer Bible study, kind of a morning out of it. Is that right, Heather? So a couple of hours, 10, 10 o'clock till like noon or something. So, so yeah, make sure uh, you set that aside. Um, Heather's got a Bible study prepared that they did with some of the pastor's wives in the area, and they really enjoyed it. So uh, fearless to face anything, I believe, is the name of the Bible study. And if you have any other questions, ask Heather. She can answer them. It will be tonight. here. Yes, thank you. So here, October 31st, Saturday, 10 a.m. And I again, that's in your bulletin. Uh, the other announcement I have is starting next Sunday, on October 25th after church, and continuing after church on Sundays in November, uh, our member, Bob Tim, has finally, uh, has kindly offered to be taking pictures for our congregation to do some kind of uh, congregational directory. Uh, there, at least as far as I'm aware, no need to sign up. Um, although after I'm done speaking, I'll let Bob fill you in on any other details if I'm, I'm off on some of them. No need to sign up. Please plan to dress as you would like if you plan on getting your picture taken on any given Sunday. Um, we'll do these service, these pictures after the service, and uh, we'll make electronic photos available to those who want them also. So this could be a good opportunity to get a Christmas photo uh, in advance or something like that. Um, so if you have any other questions, speak with Bob. Is there anything else you'd like to share right now? Anything I'm missing, Bob? Yeah. Um, the photography is going to be in the second door past the pastor's office. Might want to take a look in there. The backdrop is a tan color. And you might want to keep that in mind as you dress for it. Uh, I, I was in the church directory business for about a dozen years, and I really enjoyed it and the best pictures really are of the family dresses in unison uh, back to that tan backdrop for a minute obviously if i had a black backdrop what i'm wearing today would not look good you know you want to consider what the backdrop is and what you're wearing so you don't just blend in with it I will be using a digital camera, and I will be glad to send you your pictures uh, email if you want copies of them. Uh, we're going to choose right at the time of photography. You will choose which picture you want to be in our directory. So it will be really fast and easy to do. I could use a little help if somebody wants to kind of act as a secretary to write down, okay, this was this family, here's the family member's names. And in a directory, if you've not done one before, typically it's not left to right when you list the names. It's the parents and then the oldest child to the youngest child. That's how these pictorial directories are. So 
that's the way we'll record the information. But again, if you have any questions, if you want to help me out a little bit, uh, that would be wonderful. Go ahead and take a look at that backdrop after worship. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any other announcements they'd like to share with the congregation before we wrap up? You do? All right, Daniel, what's your announcement? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little smirk. Uh, anybody else other than my children have any announcements to share? Seeing none, uh, great to worship you as always. The Lord bless your week. We'll see you on the way.